Well, as we begin to study the book of Romans, thought we'd just take tonight and introduce it, what we're going to do. And we've done multiple books now, so it's not the first. I thought I'd give you some additional notes tonight. I give you a good many verses, but then I also give you some things that I'm going to be saying. It's just something you can take home and chew on. So I hope you got a copy and you can follow along for the most part. I'll let you know when we're in the notes, I'll say. The book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, I didn't give you that verse, but this identifies the author of the book of Romans, of course, as the Apostle Paul. Something interesting we see in Romans 16, verse 22, and you will see that as we study that, that Paul used a man named Tertius. Now, it's a little pronunciation thing that I've listened to multiple people say it, that it's, it's T-E-T. I-U-S. And he's transcribed for the most part what Paul instructed him to do. Now, lots and lots of questions about that because we know Paul's imprisoned and shipwrecked and beaten and all these things. But it's very clear, we'll see that as we study Romans 16, 22, that this man helped Paul by transcribing. The book of Romans was likely written somewhere around 56 to 58 A.D. The purpose for the writing, as with all of Paul's epistles to the churches, his purpose in writing was to proclaim the story of the Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's enough for me. Can you believe that and say amen? Because he taught doctrine. He also taught uh, how to edify and how to encourage believers, how to challenge believers who would receive this letter. Of particular concern to Paul were those whom this letter was written, those in Rome. Now, it's interesting that Paul loved Rome so much, but yet found it so hard to get there. As a matter of fact, it was very difficult for him to get there except in chains, because he only got there once he was a prisoner. Um, Paul loved the Roman people of that which he was one. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he called them loved by God and called to be saints, actually. Because he himself was a Roman citizen, he had a unique passion for those in the assembly of believers in Rome. Now, Rome had some troubles and there were some difficulties. And and the, and the, the city of Rome, after Jesus' crucifixion and all, actually pretty much just expelled all the Christians. And then there was some quiet ones that stayed. And then there arose a group of people. And then there were actually two parts to the church in Rome. And there's a whole lot of story. And we'll study some of this as we go through. But Paul definitely loved the people. Since he had not at this point visited the church in Rome, this letter also served as an instruction to them. There's a, a good many key verses. I just picked out some that I thought would, we would actually jump on as we studied through. I thought we'd just spend some time looking at those verses and kind of pondering over them as well. So I've given you each of those. They're in, in there, and they're called key verses. Romans 1.16 may be, may be the key verse for the whole book of Romans, in my opinion. And and the apostle said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentiles. Now, when you hear that verse and read that verse, and we studied that, and we will study it more, Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I, I think that's worthy for us to consider and to make sure that we're not ashamed of the gospel. And if we're not ashamed, then as we study the book of Romans, we're going to realize that part of the message to Rome was to go tell. <laughs> as Derek was here, if he was here tonight, he'd say, that seems to be the ongoing message, right? It, it really is. How are you doing? How are we doing at that? Go tell. Romans 3, verse 9 through 11, another key verse, or three key verses. What shall we conclude then? Again, I don't, we're not going to teach all this tonight. We just, we'll study this in the weeks ahead. But what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? 
Not at all, he says. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. So there's none righteous, no, not one. We know that verse. We use that verse. We've got to be careful, though. We use that kind of stuff kind of flippantly because there's not any of us, nothing righteous in any of us, nothing. And then Romans 3.21, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Again, this is just kind of to whet your appetite to, to, to kind of, these are going to be some key verses that we'll teach as we go through. And of course, you know the Romans road. We all know Romans 3.23. Read it with me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you believe that's true or not? I mean, do you really believe that? We have. We're all sinners and we all need a Savior. We're all falling short. We all fall short of the glory of God. I said Sunday, if someone mentioned something about what I said about I was a sinner in need of a Savior, and I, I still sin, but I sin less. And someone just said, that's really a good way of saying that. I never thought about sinning less, like I sin less. I said, well, the Bible says we all are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Now, I don't see that changed except for the fact that I do sin less, okay? Romans 5, 8, you know the Romans road, so it comes right along behind it. It says, but God demonstrated. What do you think about when you think about that word? But God demonstrated. What is another word we would use? He showed. What's another word? Any, any other word? He what? Teaches. Teaches. Absolutely. He shows us. He demonstrates his, I like that, his own love for us in this while we were still sinners or yet sinners that Christ died for us. So it's just, it's just really, really key that we catch these things. And then, of course, Romans 6, 23 Spells it out, doesn't it? We know that one as well. For the wages of sin. What is the wages? The payment. What's due to you and I? The payment for sin is death. But the gift, the gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Can you pay for a gift? Could you, if somebody gives you a gift and you pay them for it, is it a gift? Eh, you can't pay for it. So that means you can't work for it. There's no amount of money you could ever pay for that gift. There's no amount of work you could ever do to pay for the gift. It's a free gift. Now, it wasn't free to Jesus, but it is a free gift that we receive by faith. By faith. So, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 8 and 9, you, however, you, however, are controlled not by sinful nature, but by the Spirit. So, is he talking to lost people or saved people right here? says, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. We've got to be Spirit-led. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, that's, that's who he's talking to. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Could that be any clearer? <laughs> I mean, black, white, right? Save, lost. Evil, holy. I'm just saying, there's no way for it to be any clearer. And you'll see as we study the book... There's plenty of those clear black and white issues here. Uh, you know, save lost issues, uh, holy evil issues that we can discuss and will discuss. Romans 8, 28, a lot of times misused. A lot of times misused. But we know, right? We know. Who is the we? Who is the we? The followers, the Christ followers. And we know that in all things God works the good of those who, for the, those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He works out the details. It don't always look good. I mean, 
you can either you can have a flat tire on the side of the road and say, well, that's a bad day. Or you can say, well, I had a flat tire on the side of the road, and because I had a flat tire, I wonder what I avoided. Could have been a drunk driver coming. Could have been somebody t bone you in an intersection. Could have been, could have been, could have been, could have been. God works all things together for good. And you can look at it that way, or you can be upset about everything. I mean, really, it's the bottom line. And then Romans 8, 37, 38, and 39. I love what the apostle says here. He says, for I am convinced, man, this is good. This is my stuff right here. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height or depth, or anything else in all of creation. I think he just covered it then, didn't he? (laughs) or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I I just want to stop there a minute because I think we read some verses like that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, for whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We take things like that and we just kind of run through them. This is one of those verses This is one of those verses that I think you ought to just ponder over. Look at it with me carefully. I am convinced of this. Are you? You need to be. I'm convinced that death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height, nor any depth, nor anything else in all of creation, we will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a big statement. There's a lot happening right there. But nothing, can I just say it like that? Would that be an amen point? Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Would that be an amen? Romans 10. Verse 9 and 10. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth, so how, what must you do? What does it say? You must confess with what? Does that mean we ought to say it? Okay, is that what that means? We ought to say it. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Won't we do that right now? Jesus is Lord. Do it again. Jesus is Lord. That's confessing with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in our heart. You know, we just talked about this last Sunday. Right? We just talked about that God raised him from the dead. Confess with our mouth. Believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. What does the Bible say will happen? You will be saved. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe. And are justified. And it, and, and it could say, but it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. I'm telling you, that's not one of those verses. How, how many times do we just kind of run through that? In our mind even. We just got to take this. There's so much in the book of Romans. going to be so much good stuff to study. Romans 12, 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, not as a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And then there's some stipulations to that living sacrifice. Well, how's it to look? Evil? Evil? No. Holy. Unpleasing? No. Pleasing. Pleasing to God. But this is your spiritual act of worship. You want to worship the Lord? Here's what you do. You want to be spiritually, actively worshiping the Lord? I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your life, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing or holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's our spiritual duty is what he's saying. It's what we ought to do. Are you doing it? There's going to be a lot of questions like that. Are you doing that? Romans 12, 19. Remember, this is, just, this is just a few key verses, right? And I could have given you a whole lot more. Just a few. 
Brother Champ, I think, I'm going to say this, I think you quoted this in a, one of our meetings one night. I believe you did. I think you did. Probably a different translation. I know you hung up on that, but anyway. <laughs> no. No. And so is Patrick. But anyway. But I'm not. But anyway. But here's the verse. Romans 12, 19. Don't take revenge, my friends. Now watch this. Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to, re- to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, I'm telling you, there's a, there's a, there's a Sunday full of messages right there. Just in that. Is that a struggle? I, I'll tell you, before I was a Christian, I had a simple motto. This is before Jesus. You get me? I don't get even. I get a, a head. That's taking revenge. Have I been, what's that? I, I'm telling you, God says he's the avenger of that. He's the avenger of that. You don't need to do that. As a matter of fact, if you do, you're, you're falling into sin because he tells us don't do it. See, we want to say, well, if you drink, smoke, and cuss, and chase women, and you look at pornography on the internet, and you lie and cheat and steal and do all, that's sin, right? I just named off ten of them, right? That's ten sins, right? But what about if I take revenge? Mm. <laughs> Number 11, that's a, good one. that's a good way, brother. You see, there's so much more in it. So much more. And you know what happens? When, when, when the old you is gone and the new you comes in and God takes residence inside of you and your heart, your heart changes. Yes, listen, you sin less. You're never sinless, but, but you sin less. Does that make sense? Is that, that's just kind of Christianity 101 or something. I don't know. Probably way below all of y'all's knowledge. Romans 16, verse 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, my interjection there, to watch out for those who cause division Mm. and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Can I just tell you what he says right here? What does he say, D? Keep away from them. That's four profound words right there. Don't, don't test the water. If, if there are those kind of people that, that are contrary, that cause divisions, that pr- cause obstacle problems, that would come between you and your wife, or you and your children, or you and your church family, or you and your whatever, you and your relationship with Jesus. Avoid them. Don't be around them. Get you some new friends is what he's saying, right? That, that's, that's important. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division. I'm just going to go ahead and admit it. I know somebody that I have to stay away from because he causes divisions, and I stayed clear of them. Y'all know anybody? Of course you do. I know somebody that causes obstacles. Man, if you get this, I'm guaranteeing you, you around this dude I'm talking about. It's just going to be some confusion and some obstacles. He's just going to, he's going to test my faith is what he's going to do. Amen? And you know what I do? I don't go around them. I don't deal with them. I tell them about Jesus, but I ain't going to hang out with them. I'm just going to go another direction. That's what he says. Keep away from them. It's not an option. It's not an option. I, I put there a summary of just what I was going to say. I thought, well, they all just read along with me what I'm going to say here. And then if I don't read it like that, then you can just say, well, you changed it up like you always do. Brief summary. Paul was excited about being able to minister at the last, at last in, his, in this church. And everyone was well aware of this fact because Romans 8, uh, 1, 8 through 15 is going to tell us that. That's where I got that from. The letter to the Romans was written from Corinth. 
just prior to Paul's trip to Jerusalem to deliver the alms that had been given for the poor there. He had intended to go to Rome and then to Spain. Romans 15, 24 would clarify that. That's where that information comes from. But his plans were interrupted as he was arrested in Jerusalem. He would eventually go to Rome as a prisoner. Now Phoebe was, was, a, was a member of the church there. And somebody tell me how you would pronounce that word. How many? Anybody want to help me? See, y'all don't want to do that either, do you? It's something like cinch, century or, but anyway. Uh, it, it's a church near Corinth, and of course that information there, Romans 16 and verse 1. Most likely, the letter was carried to Rome. The book of Romans is, is primarily a work of doctrine, okay? And it's going to be important that we know that. And, and I see it as divided up in four ways. It's kind of the way we'll teach it. I've looked at a lot of people's information. Some see it a little differently. This is what I see. It's all about righteousness, okay? That's the way I see it. Righteousness needed. I think we'll see that in the first three chapters. Uh, verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 18 through uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Then we'll see how righteousness is provided. We'll see that of the work that was done by Jesus on the cross. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 21, through chapter 8, verse 39. And then righteous vindicated. Chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 36. And then righteousness practice. And that's where we'll get into the nuts and bolts of how we're to act. And you, you can go back and put those four things around all those verses and you'll see that's where those come from. The main theme, of course, it's an obvious message, an obvious lesson. It's all about righteousness. What is righteousness? What do, what do you view righteousness as? Be, be vocal. Right. What is righteousness? Right standing with God? What? Right living. Right standing with God. Right living. Absolutely. Like Jesus. Wouldn't that be a good thing to learn about? All those things? I, I mean, so that's what we want to do. And that's what the apostle was trying to do. He wanted to teach people right living, how to be right with God, how to, how to live like Jesus. He wanted to teach them about righteousness. And, of course, Paul was guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul first condemns all men of their sinfulness. I'm, I don't intend to water that down at all. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Amen? If you got a Savior, you're still a sinner. If you got a Savior, you're still a sinner. Y'all not listening. All sinners need a Savior. If you got a Savior, you're still a sinner. Is that right or not? Okay. So we all are still sinners. Nobody has arrived. Is that right or not? And we're not going to back off of that. Because that's what Paul's talking to. He's talking to the church about realizing that we're all sinners. And we need to Live Christ-like. So there's some room for improvement. He expresses his desire to preach the truth of God's word to those in Rome. It was his hope to have assurance that they were staying on the right path. And that's the word you use, the right path or being focused. He strongly points out that he is not ashamed of the gospel. We read that verse, Romans 1.16. Because it is the power by which everyone is saved. Paul <coughs> excuse me, clearly tells that. Back in your notes there. The book of Romans tells us about God. That's kind of important, isn't it? I mean, you think it comes out of the Bible. It ought to tell us about God. Who God is and what he's doing. It tells us of Jesus. What his death accomplished. We just celebrated it. Then the past three or four weeks, his death, his, 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 the, the beautiful story of all of that, even in the gruesomeness of it all, but the beautifulness of, of Christ surrendering his life. Had a young man at work today, he just said, he, he's, he's always asking me Bible stuff. And I'm like, get you a commentary, dude. No, I'm just kidding. And, and, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. And, but today he says, 
So what's one thing that Jesus didn't do on the cross that he could have done? And, and it's always in that form. It's, it's, it's like subjective to try to get me to have to give him some answer. So I'm like, one thing that he didn't do that he could have done. I said, well, he could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him. And he said, but, but if he'd have done that, and that's how he always answered. He said, but if he'd have done that, he wouldn't have fulfilled all the prophecy, right? I said, good comment. I said, so what are you looking for? Because I just have to do that sometimes because I don't really have time to spend all day playing Bible trivia with him. And he said, what if he would have, he would have just said, I ain't doing this, and struck them all down. I said, well, he sure could have done it. That's what I just said already. And he said, but he didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? I said, well, I thought we just agreed that because of prophecy and all that. He said, was it maybe because he was being obedient to the Father? See, he's always, you know, he's, he, he's got his view, and he's not wrong. He's, he is correct. You know, but anyway, so this is the conversation that I get into at work. And, uh, and it, you know what, though? I really appreciate that, that he is somebody that wants some answers and does want to know. So I asked him, I said, so who's your pastor at? Not today, or I've asked him before, and he told me. And I said, you know what you should do? Go spend some time with him and ask him these questions. I said, if you're one of what we teach and what we do at our church, making Calvary Baptist Church YouTube. He said, I'm going to check that out. I don't know, has he? Will he? But that's what Paul was willing to do. That's what we got to be willing to do. We can't be like, well, I don't know, dude. It's kind of interesting, you know. Yeah, we got to be willing to defend what we believe and to share our faith. So that's what Paul does. He, he wants us to make sure we know all about Christ. I don't even know where I'm at here. So uh, it, it tells us, the, the book tells us about ourselves what we were like without Christ, and who we are after trusting Christ. Paul points out that God did not demand men have their lives straightened out before coming to Christ. That's important, don't you think? I, I, I included that. I want you to see that. While we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. Paul uses several Old Testament. This is not in your notes. Just listen. Paul used several Old Testament people and events as illustrations of his glorious truths in the book of Romans. He used Abraham, talked about Abraham believing, and righteousness was imputed on him by his faith, not by his works. That's Romans 4, verse, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. And then in Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 9, Paul refers to David. He, he, he refers to David, and he reiterates the same truth about David, saying, blessed are they... Those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin, whose sin the Lord will never count against him. That's it. So he's using Old Testament stuff. Paul uses Adam. He uses Adam to explain to the Romans the doctrine of inherited sin. And he's teaching deep truths to them, which we're going to teach. He uses the story of Sarah. He uses the story of Sarah and Isaac, the child of promise, to illustrate the principle of Christians being the children of the promise of the divine grace of God through Christ Jesus. In chapters 9 through 11, Paul is going to recount the history of the nation of Israel. And he's going to declare that God has not completely and finally ejected Israel. Romans 11, 11 and 12. But has allowed them to stumble. To stumble. Only until the full number of Gentiles will be brought into salvation. So there's a lot going to happen in the book as we study. Practical application. This is in yours there and, and we'll conclude right here. This is kind of my summary of what I think we'll do. The book of Romans, to me, makes it clear that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Would you just think that's a good thing? That, that's important to know. Because if you believe that you can do something to save yourself, you're on the wrong mission. As a matter of fact, if you believe that, 
you're not going to inherit the kingdom. Because Jesus said, I am the way. Not one of them, some of them are part of it. The only way to the Father. So there is no other way to save yourself. Every good deed we have ever done, every good deed we have ever done, the Bible says, is as a filthy rag before God. Yesterday, we are home, and I, I've been having this drain issue, and I've slaved and suffered out for the Lord out in the yard digging and cleaning up pipe, and it's just a drain line. It's no big deal, but it's a big deal when you're two foot deep and two foot wide, and the pipe's in the bottom, and it's flat as this Bible right here. It's bad. But anyway, replaced it, and I'm out there, and I'm down on my knees in the mud and trying to make sure it's all sealed up, just dishwasher and kitchen sink. Beverly says, hey, you need to go down to Lamar White's. They got a, somebody got a flat and need you to come down there and change the tire. I just, on my knees in the hole, and I looked up, and I said, are you serious? And she said, yeah. So I did what all good local small town pastors would do and left there with the mud on my knees and my elbows and arms and went and changed the tire in the gravel parking lot at Lamar White's Grocery. Why do we do those things? We're just good neighbors, right? Of course we are. But why do we do those things? What puts those things in our heart to do those things? The Lord does that. That's not works that I do for me. It wasn't works I do for, to get into heaven. It's not works I do even because of who I say I am. It's just because you've got a new heart. You've got a new set of desires. You've got a new set of want tos. You just want to be a blessing. And then you come back and you get back in your mud hole and you do what you do. You finish the job. So, what'd you say? It ain't funny, she said. It ain't funny watching me out there, is it? But the things you do, that good that I did was good. Is equal to filthy rags before a holy God. Miss Faye loves her flowers and stuff in church. Miss Faye, it's the same. Your good works and good deeds, uh, the folks that mow and clean, and it's, it's, fil- it's nothing. It's just stuff. We've we got to keep it all in perspective. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to make... We've we got to keep it in perspective. Every good deed, everything we've ever done is just as filthy rags before God. That's what I see. So, so we're dead in our trespasses and sins are we that are only, only the grace and the mercy of God can save us. We can't, nothing about that. I didn't make that sound, sound right, did I? So, God expressed that grace and mercy, that that's grace and mercy by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place. And when we turn our lives over to Christ, we are no longer controlled by our sin nature, but we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a true thing to question yourself. Because I might not have went yesterday and done that. I might just said, let somebody else change the tire. Somebody else stop and help them anyway. Really? we got to be led by the Spirit, right? Is that true or not? And if we make confession that Jesus is Lord and believe that He is raised from the dead... We're saved and born again. Not by the works that we've done. I I kind of jumble all that together. But not by the works we've done. So we need to live our lives offered to God as a living sacrifice to Him. We need the worship of God who saved us should be our highest desire. Is it? Is your worship of God your highest desire or is it just kind of meet in there somewhere? Well, that's a good question. That's a profound thing to check out. We're going to talk a lot about that. Perhaps the best application of the book of Romans would, would apply the verse, chapter 1, verse 16 and not be ashamed of the gospel. 
not be ashamed of the gospel. But instead, let us be faithful to proclaim the gospel. Folks, I'm just telling you, we're not all what we claim we are. We're saved by grace through faith. Does everybody know that? Not you. Does everybody see that? Don't get puffed up. We're not all that. Let's make sure we keep our hand on the plow and we keep looking ahead. Let's make sure we keep looking at the author and the finisher. The one who came and lived and died and was sacrificed, was buried. But praise God, in three days he rose again. So that we, we can have victory over death as well. God forgive us. God forgive us. God help us. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. You're worthy. So excited to start a new book of study. And I pray, Father, that you'd open our hearts and minds. Hope this wasn't confusing. Hope it was encouraging and challenging that we'll be getting our hearts and lives ready to study the book of Romans. I pray, Father, I pray that you guide and direct everything we do through this book. Because there's going to be a lot of real practical stuff. There's going to be a lot of nuts and bolts. There's going to be a lot of just plain old black and white. There's going to be a lot of simple, simple stuff that we can easily look over if we don't focus on what it is you want to show us each and every time we meet together. So I pray that we'll do that. I pray this will be a core group right here. I pray that we'll invite others and encourage others to even join us on Wednesdays as we study Sundays and Wednesdays. What could really happen if our church really, really bought in and believed and followed these stories of right living, how it could change Knox should be county, how that could change this part of the state of Mississippi and how that could reign around the world if we were just truly truly surrender and submit become living sacrifices worthy and acceptable Father I pray for these I love these folks I'm grateful and thankful for the privilege and opportunity to spend this time with them each and every day pray over them and pray with them encourage them challenge one another I pray you blessings upon blessings over them we love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus name Amen.